It is therefore now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. I'm going to put forward a pretty simple question. It doesn't requ require spin. It doesn't require fluff. It doesn't re require historical context. There'll be no need to blame people from 20 years ago or say your dog ate your homework. What I want to know directly to the Minister of Energy is exactly what was the net financial loss incurred by the Liberal government when exporting power over the last two years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the exact number is $236 million in benefits, Mr. Speaker, um, as estimated by the experts in the independent electricity system operator, Mr. Speaker. And these benefits translate into reduced costs for the ratepayers, Mr. Speaker, something that we as a government see as so important. That's why we brought forward the Fair Hydro Plan and reduced rates by 25 percent, something that they voted against, Mr. Speaker. What a go since 2013. The net benefit of our exports has been over $1 billion in savings to Ontario ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. Now, if we want to go, in fact, to when they had their history and their talks about what they did in the sector, they were actually spending $7 million in electricity in one day yes, just sir. to keep the air conditioners going, Mr. Speaker. They were complaining about having to import. We now export and make money, Mr. Thank Speaker. Each side has had their chance to heckle. It's now stopping. <laughs> the message has been sent clearly. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy. The Minister of Energy just said they make money on exports. And unfortunately, Mr. Okay. Speaker, facts still matter in Ontario. And the Minister of Energy's response is absurd and factually incorrect. The Ontario Society of Professional Engineers laid it all out, and it was reported in the Financial Post. The report showed I will quote Mr. Speaker, the chief exports of surplus nuclear, solar, wind and hydropower could have cost Ontario as much as $1.25 billion over 21 months. So the facts are in the Financial Post, $1.25 billion squandered by this Liberal government, lost to Michigan, New York and all across the northern United States. So, Mr. Speaker, we don't need fake spin. Facts do matter. And will the Minister of Energy stand in the House and say that the Financial Post is wrong, the engineers are wrong? No one believes this government's fake spin. Come clean, tell us the truth. In fact, while the question was being put, I heard more noise from this side than I heard from the other side. So, we are in warnings, and I'll be quick to come up. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and he is right. Facts do matter in Ontario, and that's why we bring forward facts each and every day while they're the party that talks about spin when they have no policy and no idea on what to do in this sector, Mr. Speaker. The experts in this sector are the independent electricity system operator, the people that run our system day in and day out, Mr. Speaker. And I take their advice and I listen to what they have to say very carefully. And what the ISO says, Mr. Speaker, and maybe they should listen, is that we have made $236 million. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We made $236 million last year. We made $238 million the year before, and we made more than that the year before that, Mr. Speaker. You want to go back all the way into history? Let's go back to 2002 and 2003, yes, when Ontario paid $900 million to import electricity because they let the system Thank go. You. They let it get tatters. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Minister of Energy, it's, it's almost comedy hour hearing the Minister of Energy saying they rebuilt energy. This government rebuilt. Minister of Energy is warned.
Finish. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Energy being proud of his record on hydro, they tripled rates since 2003, and they're proud of it. They've allowed a situation to occur where we're subsidizing businesses in Michigan, Pennsylvania, the northern United States. You're charging Ontario families to subsidize our competitors. And facts matter, Mr. Speaker. So I will repeat my question to the Minister of Energy. Are you saying that the Financial Post and the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers are wrong when they say you blew a bill over a billion dollars? Stop the clock. Minister of Municipal Affairs is warned. I'm almost tempted to do something that I never thought I would think I'd have to do and offer a blanket warning to everybody. That's unheard of. But I will if I have to. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, I can understand why the government's getting testy about their own record of blowing a billion dollars, but I just want the Minister of Energy to come clean, to tell the, the House the truth. Is the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, is the Financial Post Question. correct when they say this government blew a billion dollars? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Yes. Minister. Mr. Speaker, so when we look at the experts, the independent electricity system operator who runs our system, who knows the day in and day out needs of our entire system, our entire province, Mr. Speaker, they have said since 2013 we have seen a billion dollars in savings. And of course, I'm very proud of the record of this government and what, what we've done with the electricity sector, Mr. Speaker. We've rebuilt the system that they left in tatters. $70 billion to actually fix the system, Mr. Speaker. Brown. Let's start looking at it. Eliminating coal, making sure that individuals like Matthew, a 10-year-old boy who hasn't had to go to the hospital for a year and a half because the air is clean, that's something I know everyone on this side of the house. You see it, please? You see it, please? Member from Oxford is warned. Carry on. So I will continue to work for people like Matthew and for other children in this province who need clean air to breathe, unlike that party who vote against everything that we do to make this province better for people like Matthew, for seniors, for adults, for children. We make sure that we look after the people of our province, unlike that party, Mr. Speaker. Hey, hey, hey. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Firefighters have indicated they want to see proactive health and safety for the various aspects of their trade. Their Section 21 committee provides guidance but non-mandatory health and safety regulations for firefighters. Mr. Speaker, how will the minister address reviewing the Section 21 committee mandate and a commitment to the safety of our firefighters? Will she make the guidance notes and other recommendations mandatory under the Health and Safety Act? Minister, Minister of Community Safety and Personal Services. Well, first, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm glad that the member of the, uh, the leader of the opposition is asking the question because it gives me an opportunity to thank all our firefighters across our province who are working so hard to keep yeah, our yeah. community safe, Mr. Speaker. And you know, I was uh, a guest speaker. I had the honour of going in and speak with them uh, in the last couple of days when they were here yesterday uh, for their uh, meeting. And one thing that we have committed is the partnership with our firefighters, is the collaborative efforts to raise the issues that they have brought forward for the last 10 years with us, Mr. Speaker. You know, I'm very proud of the fire safety records. We've seen a decrease all around our province regarding fire in, in buildings and housing based on some initiatives. And again, Mr. Speaker, I want to work and we are continuing Thank to you. work with our firefighters. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister. A simple yes or no, our firefighters deserve that. Will the guidance notes and other recommendations be made mandatory under the Health and Safety Act? Yes or no, can our firefighters count on you? Thank you, Minister. So, 
I would say definitely they can count on us in working in collaboration and partnership as we've done for numerous years, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, I'm very happy when uh, recently, uh, when I was appointed as a Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, uh, part of my mandate was to create a fire uh, safety technical table where lots of issues have been raised uh, collectively uh, to, to, to find the solutions to improve uh, the well-being of our firefighters. And, and again, I want to say and commend our member, uh, the Minister of Labour, for introducing PTSD. PTSD, and that was a huge component, Mr. Speaker, of our collaboration and our partnership with our firefighters. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister, since I can't get an answer on the Section 21 safety aspect for firefighters, let me ask it uh, a different question for firefighters. Uh, two years ago, I rose in this house and uh, spoke of uh, the late uh, Billy Wilkins. Over a decade ago, he uh, lost his life uh, running into a fire to keep my community, the city of Barrie, safe. A year ago, I asked that same question about the need to have survivor benefits in the province of Ontario for our first responders who sacrifice their own safety to keep our province safe. And so, for the third time, I will raise this again in the House and ask the minister if I can have this province's commitment that we will set up an Ontario survivor's benefits for the families of first responders, recognizing that they put their own family at risk, they put their own safety at risk. You know, I saw what happened to firefighter Wilkins. His family was left with nothing after he gave his life Question. for our community. Can I count on the minister to make sure we have a program like that in Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, our, first off, I want to say my heart goes out to all the families uh, that have lost loved ones in the line of duty. Uh, you know, they paid the ultimate sacrifice to keep our community safe, and we are eternally grateful. I was also very pleased, actually, to hear that our federal partner, our liberal federal partner, are establishing a public safety officer award, which includes $80 million to support families of those who have fallen in the line of duty. And every member in this House and all level of governments can agree that these families deserve supports. Mr. Speaker, our government currently supports support these families through a fund such as the Constable Joe McDonald Public Safety Officer Survivor Scholarship Fund, and it is named after uh, Constable Joseph McDonald of the Sudbury Police, Mr. Uh, Speaker, who actually uh, was shot Answer. in the line of duty in 1993. Our government commands the dedication of our public safety officers that exhibit every day. Thank you. Question, the member from London West. My question is to the Acting Premier. Today is the second day college students have been back in the classroom since the strike, and they've been offered nothing but more chaos and confusion as to whether they can withdraw from their semester, get their tuition refunded, and not lose their spot in the program of their choice. One student says, to everyone thinking that dropping the semester means you can still take second <coughs> semester, that's not the case. If you want a refund, you withdraw from your entire program. Why is the Premier forcing students who can't complete the condensed semester to leave college entirely and then reapply with no guarantee that they will get back into their program? Thank you. Uh, speaker, I, I have to say that, um, that these qu the line of questioning that the member opposite is, uh, is pursuing is is disturbing given that that was the party that has said if they were in power those students would still be suffering from this right they were very clear speaker at every turn as we tried to get students back to work they blocked our, our legislation speaker we used every opportunity last thursday we sought unanimous consent to introduce legislation this was denied by the ndp on friday we introduced legislation and then requested unanimous consent to debate the legislation the same day denied on Saturday, we asked the House to immediately vote on second and third reading. The NDP said no. On Sunday, we asked for an immediate third reading vote, but again, the NDP said no. So, Speaker, students are back Thank in you. the classroom. We're happy. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker. I would appreciate an answer to my question. After five weeks of uncertainty, students need clear information from this Premier and this Minister. They have only days to decide about the condensed program, and they need to be able to assess their options. Another student says, I only get a full refund if I withdraw the semester, which I can't even do with the program I'm in, or I lose my full year. Thanks for nothing, Ontario government. Speaker, why is this Premier forcing students to drop out completely if they want their tuition refunded? Well, Speaker, I can tell you that we are doing everything possible, and the colleges are doing everything possible to support students yeah. as to complete their semester, Speaker. And that is what we are strongly encouraging students to do. And that is why we have given a two-week the member opposite says days, two weeks, to decide what is best for them. Every student has the right to choose whether they want to withdraw with a full tuition refund or if they want to continue and work towards the, a successful completion of their year. Speaker, two weeks, we're urging students to actually take advantage of that two weeks to understand how they're going to be able to get back on track after this strike that would have gone on indefinitely had the NDP had their way. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the minister knows that students are being forced to give up their spot in their program in order to qualify for the tuition refund, with no guarantee that they will be accepted back in the future. That's not acceptable. These students want to continue the education they started, but they have lives outside of the classroom. Many have kids, jobs, and other obligations that will make it difficult to successfully complete an accelerated, condensed course. They do not want to drop out. They want to defer until January to get a fresh start on a complete semester. Why is the Premier forcing these students to drop out? Minister. Well, Speaker, I am encouraging every student who is considering conditions to actually speak with their college because there is nothing in our directive that prevents students from, from beginning in January, Speaker. But not every college program is semestered. Many have a full year speaker, and so students have to work with uh, their college to find the best option for them. If they choose to withdraw, they will get a full refund of their tuition speaker, but I'm encouraging students to work to, f to, to do the very best they can to complete the semester. Thank you. New question, member from London West. Speaker, again to the Acting Premier. Uh, speaker, this minister knows that it was inaction by her Liberal government that prolonged the strike for five weeks. The Premier's refusal to step in and facilitate a deal meant that some students had to give up their apartments. They've been forced to juggle work schedules. They've had to rearrange travel plans, maybe plans to go home for the holidays. A hardship fund capped at $500 just doesn't cut it. One student said, that doesn't even cover my rent for the month I missed, not to mention my groceries, the parking pass that I already paid for, gas money to get to campus because I work there, phone internet bill, etc. Why can't the Premier come up with a fund that will actually meet the financial hardships experienced Question. by students? Minister. Take an unprecedented action to ensure that students do have access to a hard, uh, hardship fund. It is well within the discretion of the college to determine in exceptional cases that the limit be of $500 be waived. Speaker. The member opposite keeps referring to the, an opportunity we had to interfere in collective bargaining. I want to make it very clear, Speaker, if we had interfered, they would be the first to be attacking us for interfering. We let collective bargaining proceed. The, the member opposite has referred to legislation that allows us to proceed. I explained yesterday there is overriding legislation, Speaker, and I am asking the page to send over copies of both bills and actually have real lawyers read them, and, and then they could advise the NDP whether or not they're on yes, maybe 20 years. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. 
Speaker, students have been put through the ringer because of this government's decision to sit on the sidelines, and $500 doesn't even begin to cover the cost for. Clock. Minister of Economic Development and Growth is warned. Carry on. <laughs> Another student says $500 is not enough for all the hardship students had to go through. $500 doesn't cover rent, not to mention all the other expenses during the strike. Money is nice, but it doesn't solve the real issue, which is a lack of respect for students. Speaker, when will this Premier show students the respect they deserve and direct the colleges to remove the $500 cap on, student, on the student hardship plan? Thank you. Speaker, I have to say it's kind of interesting to note that now there is real concern for students coming from that party. Because I can tell you, if you review Hansard, if you review the debates that we had about getting students back to the classroom, you will see there is no reference to students, except when it quotes the Minister of Labour and myself on this issue, Speaker. So this newfound concern for students is refreshing. I'm just not so sure how, so sure how sincere it is. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, instead of supporting students to move beyond the last five weeks of the strike, the help offered by this Liberal government is creating more chaos and confusion. The $500 cap on the compensation for students to recover from the strike simply isn't enough. And students need to know today uh, if the Premier will direct colleges to guarantee that anyone who wants to withdraw from their program and get their tuition refunded will not lose their place. When will the Premier stop paying lip service to students and come up with an appropriate solution to the mess that students have been forced to endure over the past five weeks? Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, well, Speaker, um, the member opposite might be interested to know that the hardship fund that we have put in place was informed by consultation with students, Speaker. Yeah, we right. sat down with students. Yeah. It is the first time in the history of, of uh, post-secondary post education strikes that this kind of fund has been created. Yeah. Speaker, I think the NDP is really struggling because they know that they blocked the return to the classroom yeah. of college yeah. students yeah. across this province. Yeah. Half a billion students, or half a, 500, half a million students, 500,000 students know that the NDP blocked the return to classroom, Speaker, yeah. and they're trying to pretend they are concerned for students, but it's very clear that they do not. Answer. Thank you. Your question is very sound, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. As you know, the uh, Ontario Forest Industry Association and a huge group of Northern Mayors, First Nation Chiefs, Union leaders and business leaders are here at Queen's Park today to set the record straight about the sustainability of forestry in Ontario. Section 55 of the Endangered Species Act, which removes duplication and allows the forestry sector to operate under the Crown Forest Sustainability Act, is set to expire next June. When the ESA was introduced, then Minister David Ramsey promised the forestry sector would continue to operate under the Crown Forest Sustainability Act, which since 1994 has ensured the forestry sector takes care of not only the forests, but the animals that live there. Minister, will you stand up for Northern communities and First Nations, keep your word, and let our sustainable forestry sector operate under the Crown Forest Sustainability Act? Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'm pleased to answer this question. And unlike the PCs, our government fully supports our forestry sector and the critical role that it plays in the success of the provincial economy. And I also welcome so many members from forestry, um, industry, as well as the northern communities here with us today in the galleries. Our government continues to work closely with our federal counterparts on cons caribou conservation and provides information to the federal government to support our shared conservation goals for caribou. Over the last few years, our government has invested $11 million to support Ontario's caribou conservation plan. The investments allowed ministry researchers to participate in over 50 different research projects, including monitoring of caribou.
Carry on. We're now able to make more informed decisions about resource activities or development in areas where caribou live. In addition, we're Answer. providing this information, the important information, to the federal government to support their national progress report on this species. And in the Thank supplementary, you. I'll talk about the exemption. Supplementary. The member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I might suggest the minister actually speak with David Canfield, and he'll give her a lesson on caribou. Uh -huh. But back to the minister. There are also many First Nation, Nation chiefs and representatives here today who support and are active in the forest industry. And they, too, are concerned about the upcoming expiration of Section 55 of the ESA and the lack of action on the part of this government to work towards a permanent solution. Yeah. Speaker, these Indigenous leaders want what everybody wants, the opportunity to provide economic security and jobs for their communities. Yet, Speaker, the lack of action on the part of this government is standing in the way of that. So, Speaker, I have to ask the minister, when will this government finally get to work on establishing a permanent solution to Section 55 of the Endangered Species Act Question. that is the result of a real partnership with stakeholders and right holders, such as industry experts like OFIA and First Thank Nations you. communities. Thank you very much. And uh, our government continues to engage with Indigenous organizations, forestry industry, municipalities, environmental organizations, and other stakeholders as we seek to provide um, uh, a balanced and creative solution using their input. We had all of these sectors with us earlier this year in a meeting, and we will continue to uphold Ontario's high standards of sustainable forest management and creating opportunities for northern communities. And in saying that, uh, our government knows how important this sector is. The exemption for the forestry industry expires in June 2018. Our ministry has been exploring possible solutions that minimize impacts on forest operations, protect species at risk and their habitat, and continue to provide economic opportunities for communities Answer. in northern Ontario, including those that uh, our Indigenous partners are involved with. They continue to be a valuable part of our forestry sector, and I thank, thank the work that you do each and every day. Thank you. Your question? The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Energy. In March, the privatized Hydro One filed its distribution rate applications for 2018 to 2022. And instead of reducing its rates, as the government promised would happen, the privatized Hydro One is seeking a 20 per cent increase. Wow. But there's more. On page 2038 of the application, we learned that Hydro One wants to install prepayment meters, which require the customer to pay first before they get any electricity. Oh. Wow. Everywhere that prepayment meters have been used, they have hurt struggling families. Will the government direct the Ontario Energy Board to prohibit Hydro One's use of prepayment meters? Thank you, Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As uh, the OEB is the uh, quasi-judicial organization and our regulator in, the, regulator in the province, their mandate is to have the uh, ratepayers' uh, best interests in mind, and so we leave the decisions when it comes to rate applications to the OEB, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, when it when it comes to Hydro One and their rate application, it is also important, Mr. Speaker, to talk about that the OEB is reviewing this, and again, Mr. Mr. Speaker, there will be no uh, increase more than the cost of inflation for the next four years, Mr. Speaker. That was part of the Fair Hydro Plan that that member and that party voted against, making sure that ratepayers actually had that 25 per cent reduction, Mr. Speaker. Talking about Hydro One customers, they can see anywhere between a 40 Answer. to a 50 per cent reduction because of the action that this government took to make sure that we protect ratepayers, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Minister. After Margaret Thatcher privatized the UK's water system, utilities began installing these prepayment meters. They hurt struggling families and they created a public health crisis. The Premier has hurt families in Ontario by privatizing Hydro One. Big Hydro One's installation of prepayment hydro meters would bypass Ontario's rules for disconnections. Hydro One won't have to disconnect anyone. 
The power will be cut off automatically if the customer doesn't feed the meter. The UK finally banned prepayment meters. Will the government do the same thing and stop Hydro One from installing prepayment meters? You say that, please? You say that, please? Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, this is an application that is before the OEB, and the OEB, as the quasi-judicial um, economic or, or regulator of the uh, of our electricity system, or of our energy system, Mr. Speaker, they're reviewing every uh, application with the ratepayers' best interests at in mind, Mr. Speaker. And I know the uh, the member opposite mentioned uh, the importance of uh, you know protecting the interests of the people of Ontario, and that's what this government has done by bringing forward the Fair Hydro Plan and reducing rates by. 25%. But on top of that, Mr. Speaker, with the broadening of ownership of Hydro One, not only have we seen, Mr. Speaker, reductions of anywhere between 40 and 50%, but we're actually seeing a $13.5 billion investment in the GTHA Go Regional Express Rail. It's going to quadruple the number of weekly trips to 6,000. $5.3 billion yes, in the sir. Eglinton Crosstown LRT. $1 billion or one point, yeah, $1 billion in Ottawa's LRT. $43 million Thank in you. Waterloo Regional Transit. The list goes on, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Beaches, East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Speaker, this morning we completed third reading debate on Bill 148, the Fair Workplaces and Better Jobs Act. This concludes, Speaker, more than two and a half years of evaluating the nature of our workplaces, how they have changed, and how our labour and employment laws must be amended to reflect those changes. And this was a direction given to the Minister by the Premier Wynne in his mandate letter. Now, Speaker, this consultation both inform both the Changing Workplaces Review and the resulting legislation, Bill 148. We heard from countless groups and organizations across the province, many of whom are here today with us at Queen's Park. And they include representatives from labor unions, employers, workers' advocacy groups, employees, women's advocacy groups, doctors, economists, Question. and many, many more. So, Speaker, will the minister please let us know how their input and feedback has been reflected in the Fair Work thank you. Better Jobs Act. Mr. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Beaches East York for this very important question. Let me start by thanking all the advocates that have joined us today, Speaker. They have worked so hard across this province. All they've asked for, Speaker, is to see respect and to see dignity in Ontario workplaces, Speaker. They provided incredible insight to the special advisors right throughout the Changing Workplaces Review. We listened to that input, Speaker. The feedback informed our decisions right throughout the province. Speaker, things like raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, establishing paid sick days, five days paid leave, Speaker, for victims of domestic and sexual violence. Speaker, we know the province's economy is doing very well, but not everybody is sharing in that prosperity, Speaker. We still have people in this yes, province working 35, 40 hours a week, sometimes two or three jobs, Speaker. They can't get by. It needs to change. Bill 148 is that change. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to take a moment to thank the Minister of Labour for his diligent work in bringing forward this extremely important piece of legislation. Over the past two years, and especially through this summer, I have spoken with so many of my constituents in the riding of Beaches East York about the challenges that they face at work and at home. Speaker, many have been left trying to support their families on a minimum wage that just doesn't go far enough. They need a living wage. They are trying to raise their children. They're saving for their children's education, and they're wondering how are they going to pay all their bills, let alone get ahead. Our province's economy is doing extremely well, and we cannot forget that everyone is not sharing in this prosperity. Minister, I am proud, or Speaker, I am proud that we have committed to help families in Beaches, East York, and across the province of Ontario through the measures that are included in Bill 148. And frankly, I am shocked that Question. anyone in this House could withhold support for this very important bill. Will the minister please let us know what the supporting legislation means to Ontarians? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Beaches, East York, again. I do want to thank all members of the House for the advocacy, the support they've shown on this legislation, Speaker. I agree. It's shocking to think that anybody 
party in this House would deny support for this bill. It increases the minimum wage for 1.6 million Ontarians. It ensures equal pay for work of equal value. More predictability, Speaker. Modernizing our organization practices. This is what our government believes in, Speaker. What the opposition would like to go back to the Harris years, Speaker, to when the minimum wage was frozen, $6.85. They'd like to roll back our commitment to $15 an hour, Speaker. We're not backing down. We're not going to back down. We're committed to ensuring the best of all futures for our families, Speaker. We're standing up for the rights of all Ontario workers. Yes, We're committed to fighting for Ontario families. And, Speaker, we stand opposed to those who would block these changes. Thank you. No question. Stop. Do you say it, please? Do you say it, please? New question, the member from Help, uh, My question is for the minister responsible for early years in child care. Parents across Ontario are constantly struggling to find affordable child care options, and yet a Globe and Mail article today reports that the government is placing more restrictions on what qualifies as after-school care. Under the minister's restrictions, businesses offering unique programming such as theatre and dance will only be able to offer programs three days a week. Children will go to school five days a week. Working families need options. How does limiting after-school programming help hardworking families already struggling to find after-school programs for their children? Thank you, Minister Responsible for Early Years and Child Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member opposite for this very important question, because I know the situation with Sprouts Kids has parents concerned, and I want them to know that we are working hard to resolve this issue with them, with little to no disruption to the kids that are out there needing uh, before and after school care. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to clarify something. When it comes to children in our province in care, safety is our number one priority. Absolutely. Safety is our number one priority, and we brought in rules based on recommendations made by the Ombudsman in 2014. And those recommendations came about because of a death of a child in care. And so we took those recommendations and moved forward almost right away with a set of rules that we were going to bring in place. Answer. And we gave municipalities and everyone else two years to transition, and those rules came into effect three months ago. Okay. Supplementary. It is offensive that this minister is comparing after school programs that provide theater, arts, math, tutoring to unregulated care that happened. It's, it's offensive to those businesses. While parents are struggling to find childcare they can afford, you are limiting their options. This government appears to be on a mission to reduce the choices and availability for after-school care in Ontario. To quote a mum, it feels really wrong to have the government come in and tell you what you're able to choose for your child for an after-school program. How many after-school programs will be shut down, leaving families with fewer options for after-school care? Thank you. Mr. Minister. Speaker, I am once again really pleased to stand up and answer this question because, frankly, it really exposes how little the member opposite understands what's going on. There are a wide range of programs that are offered when it comes to child care. We have child care, we have before and after school programs, and we have recreational programs. And so we are making sure that when it comes to our children being in a safe environment, that they are protected. Those children who are five years of age and under are, have different sets of rules than those who are six to 12 years of age. I also want to point out, Mr. Speaker, that we are now int have introduced before and after school care to our schools where there is sufficient demand across the province. 16,000 more children wow. in Ontario are now access spaces. That is as of September 1st. We worked hard to deliver that. 83% of... 
New question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, the crisis in childcare in this province continues today. In the east end of Toronto, parents of 97 children were given one week's notice to find alternative before and after school care after Sprouts, a neighbourhood recreation and walk safe program, was found to be in contravention of the Early Years in Child Care Act. Midway through the school year, east end parents were left with no full week options. The government created chaos for these families, taking them days to respond to parents' serious concerns. And because of this uproar, the ministry last night made an exception. Toronto Councillor Janet Davis has said it best. This province has totally bungled the school age program rules, and it begs the question, Mr. Speaker, will this government be cracking down on every karate program and dance studio in the province of Ontario now? Yeah. Yes, sir. To the Minister of Early Years and Child Care. Minister. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, I'm pleased to rise and answer this question because it is so important. We are absolutely transforming the way we are delivering childcare in this province. We have been doing it for more than a year. Those pieces that we are moving forward with are underway. I have to say that the member opposite and the party opposite is a little late coming to the party. Yeah. We have moved forward with a framework that is now in place and that is expanding the childcare in this province by 100,000 additional spaces. In addition to that, we have moved forward with $1.6 billion in capital funding. That will now move into place in 2018 and will build spaces. Right now, in this year, the 2017-18 year, we have moved forward with $200 million. 24,000 spaces are being created in this year alone. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we are making fundamental changes to ensure that we are building a solid foundation when it comes to children and childcare in this province. And when it comes to this instance yes, of before and after care and Sprouts Kids, my officials are there right now working with them to ensure that they are compliant and those children have care. Thank you. And again to the Acting Premier, one parent, one parent with a daughter in the Sprouts program said that the move to limit Sprouts before and after school care was made by, and I quote, a government that doesn't really understand or support a working family. Parents across the province who rely on recreational programs like Sprouts, they do so because they are unable to find licensed, affordable childcare for their children. Certainly they can't after 14 years of this Liberal government. With other neighbourhood programs uh, full for the remainder of the school year, these East End Toronto parents were left with no comprehensive options. Speaker, Ontario families deserve quality, affordable and accessible childcare in this province. What is the government's plan for authorized recreational programs, or will the Ontario parents in this case be expected to lurch from crisis to crisis across this province? Thank you. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, once again, I'm really pleased to answer this question because it's so important. So, first of all, absolutely, when the situation with Sprouts Kids came to light, we were concerned about those parents and those kids, and we were working hard to ensure that we resolve the issue. Frankly, I was a bit surprised because these rules came into force September 1, and for the last two years, various programs around the province have been working to transition, and my teams have been working with them to ensure that we do it and help them get on track. Right Right now we are working with these families, but I do want to point out something, Mr. Speaker. When you have children that are five, four, and three years old in care, and when you are lumping them in with the six to twelve year olds, the rules are different. You cannot bypass those child care rules. They are there to make sure we are supporting those children. Answer. And they are strict because of safety. Thank you. Your question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sports. The province has a, an ambitious, ambitious, ambitious uh, vision to transform Ontario Place into a modern, vibrant, year-round waterfront destination that builds on a legacy of innovation, fun, mu live music, and engaged residents and visitors of all ages. This summer, we reopened the Trillium Park and William G. Davis Trail, which adds 7.5 acres of green space to Toronto's waterfront. That's a real benefit to residents of Liberty Village, Illinois, and Fort York communities. We host four diverse festivals in the spring and summer to celebrate the province's uh, 150th anniversary. Speaker, through you to the minister. Can she tell us more about um, what she announced earlier this month pertaining Question. to the reopening of iconic Sinosphere Theatre? Thank you. 
to Minister of Tourism, Culture, Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for his question. Speaker, it's been an extremely exciting year for Ontario Place. For over 40 years, Ontario Place has been a cultural centerpiece and a hub for all activities for, for, for all Ontarians to enjoy. And I'm excited to have this opportunity to speak to the iconic Cinesphere, an exciting part of our Ontario Place revitalization. I had the pleasure of welcoming Ontarians back to the Cinesphere earlier this month. In doing so, we were able to introduce a new generation to the world's first permanent IMAX theatre. We revamped the space to make it a year-round facility that everyone can enjoy, making upgrades to the entrance, acoustics, the lighting, and there's a new digital projector as well. And that's what makes the Cinesphere truly unique. Because it is a Canadian innovation, the IMAX 70mm film experience is truly a visual experience that is unparalleled. Finally, we're enhancing access to the Cinesphere too Answer. by partnering with charitable organizations so that the community can come free of charge so that everyone can enjoy the unique unique experience that Ontario Place in the Cinesphere bring, Mr. Speaker. I thank you, Minister, for the answer. It's wonderful, you know, it's wonderful to hear that all the great work has been done to transform Ontario Place to a life, lively recreational and cultural space for everyone to enjoy. After all, the legacy of Ontario Place was and continues to be one, one of the culture's engagement in discovery. The development that we see on our beautiful waterfront is exciting, and to hear that many Ontarians have already been on the site, whether it's to watch the great flicks at iconic Cinesphere or go for a bike ride along the park and trail, makes us want to build on this great momentum even further. Speaker, to the minister, can she explain to this house how is her ministry um, will continue to make the vision of realizing, sorry, of a realized Ontario place, uh, a revitalized Ontario place, uh, a reality. Thank, thank you. you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the member mentioned, the vision for a revitalized Ontario place is one of lively cultural engagement. We call it Ontario Place for a reason, Speaker. It's a place for all Ontarians. And our next steps in the revitalization plan will continue to build on that principle. I'm happy to say that we're now officially in the design phase to create a wonderful green space at the 20-acre Celebration Common at Ontario Place. We heard what Ontarians wanted to see and we listened. The space will be transformed and be used for festivals, community events and recreation. The ambitious vision for a modern, vibrant, year-round waterfront destination is well underway, and we look forward to continuing to welcome all Ontarians to what is truly a wonderful jewel on the waterfront of Canada's largest city. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. For the question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Thanks. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Uh, Speaker, while we pay to send our green energy across the border, Ontario auto dealers are being forced to pay here at home for yet another Liberal Green scheme. Of course, long on promises and taxpayer funding, but short on results. Boasting $14,000 rebates per luxury electric car, and of course the minister's own electric car lot, the Liberal Electric Vehicle Program has become a costly vanity project propped up by tax failures. Now we hear that the rebate delivered at point of sale has auto dealers paying out of pocket while they await promised government reimbursement that's being held back. Unbelievable. Dealers in the GTA alone are owed well over $2 million. Speaker, will the minister explain why he is making auto dealers pay the price for his electric car subsidies? Question. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for his question. I, uh, I could, couldn't help but notice from the tone of the question, if not the exact language, that it seems implied in the question that that member and his leader certainly don't seem to support the idea that we'd want to deploy more zero GHG emitting vehicles on our roads. Speaker, our government could not stand more starkly in contrast to that backward looking uh, that backward looking assertion on their part, Speaker. What we've seen here in Ontario uh, since we've introduced uh, even more generous electric vehicle incentives, uh, Speaker, through our electric vehicle incentive program. Uh, which, as he pointed out, offers up to $14,000 uh, for those individuals who choose to buy or lease one of these, and up to $1,000 by way of a rebate for those, uh, for those families. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. Finish, please. Uh, for those families that choose to install home based charging infrastructure, what we've seen, Speaker, is actually a dramatic increase in terms of the uptake amongst those families, especially as more products come yes, online that are more affordable for those uh, middle-class families across the province who want to do their part to fight climate change, unlike that member and his leader, Speaker. Thanks Thank very you. much. Supplementary. Right, well, you know, talk about prompt payment. 
We just don't think that auto dealers should be on the hook to pay for Liberal subsidies. This program, of course, has been a wheel-spinning exercise since they rolled it out. Of course, the Liberals promised 485 electric vehicle charging stations by last spring. A third of them weren't ready for the summer driving season. They promised 20 per cent of the Ontario Public Service vehicles would be electric by 2020. In 2017, they are just at 4 per cent. And they promised to pay drivers massive incentives to dry, drive electric cars off the lot. Now they're failing to deliver those rebates to the auto dealer, who is, of course, caught now in the middle. Minister, why wow. are you leaving Ontario auto dealers to foot the bill for your failing program, and when will you actually pay them back? $2 million alone in the GTA for auto dealers. When will Question. you pay them back? You know, Speaker, I, I think it would be far more forthright of that member to stand up and just declare he and his leader don't support the purchase release of electric vehicles in the province. That they don't, that they don't support, they don't support supporting middle-class families in this province who want to do their part to fight climate change. Member from Kitchener, Conestoga, is warned. Carry on. I was saying, Speaker, they're making it abundantly clear using the code language that's embedded in that question to make it, again, abundantly clear that they don't support these initiatives, which is a real shame, Speaker, because we know as we put more incentives into the marketplace, more and more middle income families are actually making the choice to do their part to fight climate change by purchasing or leasing these vehicles, Speaker. I will say, uh, along with the electric vehicle incentive program, the EVCO program, which is deploying a charging network right across the province, Speaker, 500 Answer. charging stations across. Across 250 unique locations, Speaker, right across the province, we're making it easier every single day to support those Ontario families who want to do their part to fight climate change. Thanks very much. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. For years, Hamiltonians have been promised frequent, all-day, two-way go rail service. And, Speaker, we're still waiting. And now it looks like we're going to wait even longer. Despite spending $80 million on two new GO stations in Hamilton, it seems the government plans to leave these stations empty most of the time. Hamiltonians are calling them ghost stations. Why hasn't this government made frequent GO service from these new stations a priority? Transportation. Mr. Transportation. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I, I appreciate the question. I, I'll, I always have. I always love having the opportunity to stand in my place and talk about the fact that our government is in fact building Go Regional Express Rail, Speaker. I, I will. I will say. I will say perhaps that member would want to speak to her colleague from Hamilton East Stony Creek. He, he's told me many times in the past, Speaker, he's delighted that our government's decided to build an additional GO station at Confederation, uh, at Confederation in Stony Creek, Speaker. And of course, thanks almost exclusively <coughs> to the advocacy of my colleague from St. Catharines. Carry on. Speaker, as I was saying, thanks almost exclusively to the long-standing advocacy of my colleague from St. Catharines, our government has decided to extend GO train service all the way to Niagara Falls. Speaker. That's work that we'll continue to be focused on. Speaker, I would point out that there is a section of the Lakeshore West Corridor, that member may not know this, that is actually currently owned by CN. Sorry. I hope so. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The purpose of spending $80 million on two new GO stations in Hamilton is not to provide photo ops for Liberal politicians. The purpose is to provide frequent GO service that Hamiltonians have been promised for years. Instead, we get ghost stations. Exactly when can Hamiltonians expect all-day two-way GO service through these new stations? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, I have no clue why the member from Hamilton Mountain wants to so vociferously attack the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, but that's a question they can sort out, they can sort out in their caucus office, Speaker. As I was saying in my initial answer, uh, that member may not realize that there's a portion of what's known as the Lakeshore West Corridor that's currently owned by CN, Speaker, and they carry an awful lot of freight on that section of the, of the Lakeshore West Corridor. Our government, through Metrolinx, is working closely with both CN and NCP to make sure that we can rationalize freight service and ultimately deliver more frequent GO train service to Niagara Falls, to Bowmanville, to Barrie, and ultimately through Stony Creek all the way out to other places in Hamilton and beyond. Thank you very much, Speaker. 
seated, please? Be seated, please. No. Start the clock. <laughs> New question, member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Great, Each year, Ontarians generate about 3.7 million tonnes of waste from food and organic materials, with more than 60 per cent sent to landfill. In fact, food and organic wastes make up approximately one third of Ontario's total waste stream. Our government recognizes that this needs to change. Last week, our government introduced our proposed food and organic waste framework, which outlines our path forward for reducing food waste and increasing the recovery of organic materials in Ontario. The framework is currently posted to the Environmental Registry for public consultation. Speaker, can the minister please explain to the House how our proposed organics frame, framework would help reduce organic waste while benefiting Ontario's economy? Thank you. Minister of the Environment, Climate Change. Oh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Davenport for that very important question. You know, as uh, as the member mentioned, Speaker, uh, last week uh, my ministry introduced our proposed food and organic waste framework, right? The proposed framework is the next step in moving Ontario toward a circular economy, uh, an economy where food and organic waste is no longer seen as waste but as a resource, Mr. Speaker. We know that recovering organic uh, resources not only is beneficial to the uh, environment, but it also builds our economy. Research from the UK speaker shows that there is $14 of financial benefit for every $1 invested in food waste prevention. So our proposed organic framework has the potential to create new jobs in Ontario. Current efforts, speaker, current efforts to divert food and organic waste create about 1,700 jobs in Ontario as we speak. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, we know that managing waste and reusing our resources is a critical part of achieving our goals to protect our land and environment, create a greener future for Ontarians, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. When food and organic waste breaks down in landfills, it, reduce, it produces greenhouse gases. In 2015, greenhouse gas emissions from the waste sector accounted for about 5 per cent of total greenhouse gas emissions in the province. That amounts to 8.6 megatons of carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere. Mr. Speaker, if global food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of carbon dioxide after the United States and China. That's why Ontario is proposing to take strong action to prevent organic Question. and food waste from ending up in landfills. Can the minister please describe to the House how recovering organic and food resources would benefit Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from, for, uh, from Davenport for uh, this question. You know, Speaker, our food and organics framework is the next step toward uh, moving toward a waste-free Ontario. Uh, if, we, if we doubled the province's current resource recovery rate of food and organic waste, we could reduce an additional 1.1 megatons in greenhouse gas emissions. You know, Speaker, that's the equivalent of removing approximately 260,000 cars from Ontario's roads each year. That's each year, Mr. Speaker. And it's bringing us closer to our climate change goals. Under our Climate Change Action Plan, Speaker, we're moving forward to reduce greenhouse gases and stimulate economic growth. Meanwhile, Speaker, meanwhile, members opposite have no real plan Answer. to reduce organic waste and keep resources out of landfill in Ontario, and they have no real plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, no real plan to fight climate change, Thank you. Speaker. No question. The member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My, uh, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. According to the Toronto Star, inmates at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre are suing the government. 
Between the years of 2010 and 13, there have been a pattern of systematic negligence. The lawsuit cites overcrowded, unsanitary, and unsafe conditions. Sadly, this is not an isolated problem. A recent report by the Independent Advisor on Corrections Reform describes shocking abuses and disorder in Ontario's detention centres. Detention centres are overcrowded and cell block violence is a huge problem everywhere. Minister, it doesn't appear as though you have the backs of our COs. You aren't giving them the resources they need to carry out their duties safely. I've said that before that minor tinkering isn't going to fix Question. the crisis in corrections. Minister, you're, you're failing our correctional officers, so yep, what specifically failed. are you going to do to solve these Thank problems? You. Minister, you receive from correctional services. Thank you very much uh, to the member for uh, that question. Uh, as he knows, I cannot uh, comment specifically on anything, but what I want to share with this House cases. is our Not full commitment cases. on uh, moving forward in the transformation of our correction system. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have uh, made investment uh, in the past few years, and we are going forward in bringing in this House legislation based on recommendations from Mr. Howard Sapers, from the Ombudsman, and we have engaged also with our stakeholder, our union representative, our Indigenous communities in bringing the most um, the biggest transformation in Ontario's history when it comes to our correction system, Mr. Speaker. I was also very yes, happy sir. all throughout the this, this summer to visit our institutions and meet with frontline workers, and I want to say thank you thank to the you. men and women who work in our institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. You, you haven't been listening no. to the correctional officers around the province. On the Liberals' watch, prisoners like Adam Capay have been held in solitary confinement while awaiting trial. Capay was held for four years in conditions so degrading that previous inmates of the same cell died. But the Liberals didn't care. They ignored repeated coroner's inquests, warning of unsafe conditions. And it only became a problem for this government when Capay's case reached the newspapers. Our correctional officers, speakers, Speaker, have brought the same problems to this ministry's attention many times before. The Ontario Human Rights Commission is now suing the ministry over Capay case. And now inmates are suing you for systematic negligence. Now, Minister, you're not listening to our frontline staff the correctional officers who are the boots on the ground and who face behavioral uncertainty Question. with inmates daily. The Premier claims that she wants to be remembered as a social justice Premier. So, Minister, does this appalling state of corrections pass for Thank social you. justice? Minister. So, I know I have time limited, but Mr. Speaker, the question of that member is troubling for me in one sense. Let's remember the time that when this party was in power, and I hear this actually all throughout my tour of our institutions this summer, Mr. Speaker. You know, we hear about the failed privatization of our jail and the cuts and the cuts of social programs that used to exist in our institutions. I hear about the farming program, the, the uh, construction programs that were cut under that government, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. You know what? We have made full commitment in bringing forward the most transformation correction system policy-driven new act in this house this fall, Answer. and we have engaged with not only our frontline workers but within everyone in our system to make sure that we get this Thank right you. for all on Thank you. The leader of the third party on a point of order. Speaker, I'm uh, just wanting to welcome all of those labour activists and labour leaders who are here today joining us with the uh, vote for 1548 coming this, this afternoon. So welcome everyone. It's uh, good to see you here. Thank you for all your hard work. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, I'm happy to introduce today in Members East, East Gallery a member of the Cambridge Prevent, uh, Professional Firefighters Association, a good friend and neighbour of mine, John Holman. Welcome to Queen's Park. Minister of Status and Women. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to ensure that my record correctly reflects that it's 16,000 before and after school spaces in schools. I understand there may be some, uh, some it may possibly say 60,000. It's 16,000. Thank you. Minister. I just want to Senator. recognize a dear friend of mine, Ibrahim Daniel, who's in the, la who's in the members' lounge. Thank you. Oh, members' gallery. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion to third reading of Bill 148, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act 2000 and Labour Relations Act 1995, and to make related amendments to other acts. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
All members, please take your seats. Earlier today, Mr. Duguid moved third reading of Bill 148, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act 2000 and the Labour Relations Act 1995, and to make related amendments to other acts. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Naki. Mr. Naki. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. 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 Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandler. Mr. Sandler. Mr. 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 Susan. Mr. Susan. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Domerlo. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Vernio. Ms. Vernio. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Shibby Song. Ms. Shibby Song. Mr. Van Tuck. Mr. Van Tuck. Madame Jelly. Madame Jelly. Ms. De Novo. Ms. De Novo. Mr. Tabbs. Mr. Tabbs. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Shimanta. Mr. Shimanta. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The ayes are 67, the nays are 26. The ayes being 67 and the nays being 20, uh, 67 and the nays being 27, I declare the motion carried. It is resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the government notice of motion number 42 relating to the allocation of time on Bill 174, an act to enact the Cannabis Act 2017, the Ontario Cannabis uh, Retail Corporation Act 2017, and the Smoke Free Ontario Act 2017, and to repeal two acts and to make amendments to the Highway Traffic Act respecting alcohol, drugs, and other matters. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bell.
On November 21, 2017, Mr. Morrow moved government notice of motion number 42 relating to allocation of time on Bill 174, an act to enact Cannabis Act 2017 and the Ontario Cannabis Retail Corporation Act 2017 and the Smoke Free Ontario Act 2017 to repeal two acts and to make amendments to the Highway Traffic Act respecting alcohol, drugs, and other matters. All those in favour, please rise. One at a time, be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mrs. Jasson. Mrs. Jasson. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Renil. Ms. Renil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Madame Gelinas. Madame Gelinas. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasheck. Mr. Natasheck. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The ayes are 50, the nays are 41. The ayes being 50, the nays being 41, I declare their motion carried. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.